Uh, today is Good Friday, of course, and most of you know that Good Friday is, in a lot of ways, the most bittersweet of all uh, days on the Christian calendar. On, on one hand, of course, Good Friday is, is a sorrow because we remember the many things that Christ suffered at the hands of his own creation. But on the other hand, Good Friday is also a joy because there's no clearer picture uh, of God's incredible love for each and every one of us than when we see Jesus dying on the cross. Uh, and so before we get into it, I just wanna say this for the record officially, that I believe that Jesus is the savior of the world. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I don't mean that in just kind of a, I'm supposed to say that because I'm a pastor kind of way. Like I actually believe that. And as the world continues in so many ways to destroy itself and uh, as we destroy each other, I believe that Jesus Christ is the great hope of the world. And that's, and that's all about the cross. Uh, and so tonight, what we're going to do, we're doing something a little different, but the mission is simple, is simply this, is that we would enter into the story of Good Friday and we would let the mystery of the crucified God come and capture our hearts. It's kind of a, a strange phrase, don't you think? Uh, a crucified God. Like what kind of deity would allow himself to be killed by his own creation? But, but listen, Jesus is God. And paradoxically, there is no clearer picture of who God is and who God has always been than when you see Jesus dying on the cross saying, Father, forgive them. And so... The, the forgiveness that is offered on the cross and in the following resurrection, it, it's not just the climax of the Bible, even though it is that, it's the climax of the history of the world. There, there is no more important event in history than when you see Jesus dying on the cross and raising from the grave. Nations rise and fall. But the resurrection, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ will live on for eternity. Uh, so, so what we're wanting to do tonight is just enter into the story. So come with us. Uh, tonight we're not at Believer Center of Albuquerque uh, in New Mexico. Our hearts and our minds are in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. We are one of the pilgrims who have followed Jesus in to uh, the holy city. We believe, we believe that Jesus is the savior of the world and it's Holy Week. We're one of the pilgrims who have come and we believe that Jesus is the one who would liberate us from oppression. And what we mean by that is, is that Jesus is the Messiah. And so we've followed him from Galilee to Jerusalem. And to us on this day, everything seems pretty much fine. Uh, we have no idea that in a few short days, uh, this precious man, this compassionate healer, uh, will be stripped naked and beaten and brutally killed, betrayed, shivering, and alone. But today, for us, uh, it's a good day. Uh, we arrive in Jerusalem, which is the holy city, and Jesus comes and he does something really unusual. He comes and he enters the city riding on a donkey. But not just any donkey, right? A colt, which is a tiny little baby donkey. It was ridiculous. If you can picture Jesus riding into Jerusalem uh, on a tiny donkey with his feet brushing against the ground. Uh, and that's not an accident. Theologians would go on to describe this moment in history as a parody of the great rulers of the day. So you see this same week, Passover, uh, Pilate, he's the Roman governor, he is also coming in uh, to Jerusalem. He doesn't live in Jerusalem. The, the governor, he doesn't care much for commoners. No, Pontius Pilate, he has, uh, he has a lovely home on the seaside, right off of the Mediterranean Sea. In fact, you can still go there today. You can see the ruins uh, of Pontius Pilate's house. It's next to Herod the Great in the city named after Caesar, Caesarea. It's Passover, so it's this Jewish holiday which we would celebrate our liberation. That's the thing about if you were a Jew, you've spent most of your life in oppression. You think about the Egyptians and then you think about the Persians and now we have found ourselves once again in oppression under the Roman Empire. And so this holiday where we would go and we would celebrate our liberation, well, it's a pretty good time to uh, revolt and rebel. 
In fact, this happened multiple times. And so the Roman governor, he, he couldn't just sit back and relax in his great mansion and oversee. No, he had, to, he had to come and make sure everyone stayed in line. And so this same week, you have both Jesus and Pilate riding into Jerusalem. But Pontius Pilate, he was not riding a donkey. No, no. He was riding this majestic animal known as a war horse. If you were to see him riding on this magnificent beast, you might say, uh, look at the mighty governor full of strength and glory and dignity. Meanwhile, also riding in is this peasant preacher prophet guy from Nowheresville, Galilee, riding on a tiny little donkey surrounded by the poor. Who are, who are decrying that, that he, is, he is the one true king. It's a ridiculous sight. In fact, you could maybe even imagine people laughing. But, uh, but we don't think so. We don't think it's funny. With palm branches waving, we say this, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. See, we believe Jesus is the one true king. Enough of Herod, enough of Caesar. We believe Jesus is the true king. Well, four days would pass and Jesus and the disciples, they sit down for dinner. This isn't a new thing. They, they ate together all the time. But what they didn't realize is that this was going to be the last time they'd be together as the 12. Nor did they realize that this was the last time they would be with Jesus before he's killed. While they were eating, Jesus took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. You know, really, really, in a lot of ways, it's sort of a shame that they call this the Last Supper. And in, in lots of different ways, this is actually the first of lots and lots and lots of this kind of suppers that will happen uh, for generations to come. In fact, for 2,000 years, the church has both remembered and celebrated essentially this exact moment in reenaction when we receive uh, communion. Years later, the Apostle Paul would describe receiving communion as participation in the body and blood of Jesus. And so in a moment here, even at the very beginning of service, we're gonna pass the elements and receive communion. Uh, if this is your first time, it's gonna be a small piece of bread and even a, an even smaller cup uh, of juice. But we don't want you to, to miss the significance of what's happening uh, in this part of service. It's participation and it's unity and it's sacrifice and it's mystery. Uh, this for each and every one of you in the room tonight, if you choose uh, to be awake for it, can be, in ta can be a tangible encounter with a God who desires to be known. And so um, the ushers are gonna go ahead and pass, but the instruction is this, just hold on to the elements uh, in your hand, and then once they've passed out for everybody, we'll receive the elements together. So you guys can go ahead and pass, thank you.
okay, look up at me. So in this, in this moment, in the story, Jesus, he breaks the bread and he offers it to the 12, to each of them. So he would go and he would offer it to John, who is the longest living disciple, right? He would, he would go on to faithfully follow Jesus all the days of his life. The bread was also offered to Peter. Peter, who when Jesus mentions his own suffering, he would say, I would never let that happen, even if I have to die, right? Yet by the end of the night, he would betray Jesus three times. And the bread was also offered to Judas, right? The betrayer, the one who would bless Jesus with his words uh, and then curse Jesus underneath his breath and stab him in the back. And so not only is the offer extended to those in society that the society has deemed unworthy, uh, the offer is extended even to those who would betray Jesus that same night. Uh, and this was, this was an offer that Judas in his brokenness was unable to receive. And so the question for you tonight is, is simply this, can you? Right? Can, can you receive uh, the kindness of Jesus that's neither earned nor deserved. It's simply a free gift that can just be received. No matter what you've done, no matter who you are, no matter how wounded you feel, no matter how guilty you feel, uh, this moment is for you. And the invitation of Jesus to come to his table is absolutely for you. And so bow your heads and we'll pray. Uh, Lord Jesus, we come to your table tonight as grateful people. And even in these short moments, we would deliberately focus our hearts and our minds on your wonderful grace. To the, to the sick, you're a healer. And to the sinner, you're a forgiver. To the oppressed, you're a liberator. To the fallen, you're a restorer. Life can be, life can be so complicated in this day and age, but, but when we come to your table, everything gets real simple. This is just a simple gift that's offered to us and a simple yes being all that you require in response. So that's what we do tonight. Tonight, we just say yes. We say yes to your forgiveness. We say yes to your grace. We say yes to your mercy. We say yes to your kindness. We say yes to your invitation. And so, Jesus, tonight as we come to your table, we remember your death, we proclaim your resurrection, and we await your return. So let's eat the bread and drink from the cup together. And as you're finished, just put the cup underneath your seat, if you would, or in, under the seat of your neighbor, if you'd like. <laughs> now later, Jesus, Jesus is troubled after they eat, and so he goes to the garden to pray. He's, he's in anguish, and he's troubled, and Jesus is afraid, uh, and that's when they would come for him. It's the temple police led by Judas who would betray Jesus with a kiss. And Jesus is arrested and he's taken away.
So Jesus is taken to the house of Caiaphas. So Caiaphas was the the high priest. And it was a house, but it was more like a palace, I guess you could say. Uh, And in front of the religious council, Jesus is questioned. Caiaphas, he places Jesus under oath. And he says this, I adjure you by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the son of God. And Jesus says, it is as you say. Then Caiaphas tore his robes and said, he has uttered blasphemy. What is your judgment? They answered, he deserves death. Then they spit in his face and struck him. See, the religious leaders of the day, the priests, they wanted to kill him right then and there, uh, but there's only one problem. See, they weren't allowed to execute people. This was a right that the Romans reserved just for themselves, so they would need Pilate to uh, oversee the execution. Um, But as luck would have it, he was still in town. And so there's this water cistern, which is turned into a dungeon. It's a shame that a priest would have a dungeon, but he did. And there's no doubt that that's where they kept Jesus. And so they would lower Jesus from the top with a rope. They did the same thing to Jeremiah when he protested the temple six centuries earlier. In fact, you can actually go to the cistern today and see where they believe Jesus was uh, kept. It's currently overseen by Franciscan monks. I have a picture of it. 
Um, and you can, see, you can see here that in the corner there's a, a small pulpit, and on that pulpit is a small notebook. Um, and in that notebook is Psalm 88 in every kind of language, page after page after page, Spanish, English, French, Japanese. You can just flip and find Psalm 88 in your own language. And so you might be thinking, well, why Psalm 88? Well, it's because Psalm 88 is the psalm of the pit. Uh, here the psalmist writes about despair and the feelings of falling apart and being in darkness. And church, church history would actually go on to tell us that when Jesus was alone in the pitch black of the pit, uh, he could be heard praying Psalm chapter 88. And so I'm wondering if you would be willing to picture in your mind, picture Jesus in the water cistern turned into a dungeon in the pitch black awaiting his execution, leaned up against the wall, um, and this was his prayer. O Lord, my God, my Savior, by day and night I cry to you. Let my prayer enter into your presence. Incline your ear to my lamentation, for I am full of trouble. My life is at the brink of the grave. I am counted among those who go down to the pit. I have become like one who has no strength. Lost among the dead like a slain who lies in the grave, whom you remember no more, for they are cut off from your hand." You have laid me in the depths of the pit, in dark places and in the abyss. You have put my friends far from me. You have made me to be abhorred by them. I am in prison and cannot get free. My sight has failed me because of trouble. Lord, I have called upon you daily. I have stretched out my hands to you. Do you work wonders for the dead? Will those who have died stand up and give you thanks? Will your loving kindness be declared in the grave, your faithfulness in the land of destruction? Will your wonders be known in the dark or your righteousness in the country where all is forgotten? But as for me, O Lord, I cry to you for help. In the morning, my prayer comes before you. Lord, why have you rejected me? Why have you hidden your face from me? Ever since my youth, I have been afflicted and at the point of death, I have borne your terrors with a troubled mind. They surround me all day long like a flood. They encompass me on every side. My friend and my neighbor, you have put far from me and darkness is my only companion. And there Jesus sits and he waits for the sun to rise on the day of his execution. Well, they lead Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters. Remember this, remember, this is Pilate. It was early morning. They themselves did not enter the governor's headquarters so that they would not be defiled, but could eat the Passover. So Pilate went outside to them and said this, what accusation do you bring against this man? They answered him, if this man were not doing evil, we would not have delivered him over to you. Pilate said to them, take him yourself and judge him by your own law. The Jews said to him, it is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. So Pilate entered his headquarters and called Jesus and said to him, are you the king of the Jews? So, so, so that's the question, right, for Pilate. Pilate's not a religious man. <laughs> he doesn't care anything about some obscure Jewish religion, right? If, if he's going to kill Jesus, it's going to be for something political. Treason because you can't just have someone come and taking power from Caesar. You can't have someone claiming to be king, right? It would be unpatriotic. Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, do you say this on your own accord or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, am I a Jew? You, your own nation and chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered and said this, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting. But my kingdom is not of this world. See, the kingdom of God is not like anything else. Think about the kingdoms of the world, Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome, right? These are the kingdoms of the world. It would go on to say the, the way of the beast. But the kingdom of God is not like anything else that we see in the world. So Pilate, he would go back. He went outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him. 
but you have a custom that you should release one man for you at the Passover. So do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out, not this man, but Barabbas. Barabbas Barabbas was a revolutionary. This is where uh, Mel Gibson didn't get it quite wrong, uh, right? Mel Gibson paints him to be like a maniacal psychopath killer. That's, that's not what Barabbas was. Barabbas was a hero. Uh, he led an uprising against the oppressive Roman Empire, and in doing so, some of the Romans were killed. So he was a freedom fighter if you were, if you were a Jew. Uh, uh, by the way, his, his full name, Jesus bar Abba. Jesus bar Abbas, which is translated this, Jesus, son of the father. So it's awkward. Now you've got, you've got two Jesuses on Palm Sunday, right? One who, who saves by shedding his own blood and another who saves by shedding the blood of his enemies. And the question is this, which one do they want? And it's the question for you too. Right? Which, which Jesus do you want? Which Jesus do you want to keep and which Jesus do you want to kill? Do you want to keep the violent revolutionary or do you want to keep the Jesus who speaks of a different kind of kingdom? So again, they, they cry out, they say, not this man, but Barabbas. So Pilate went out again and said to them, see, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, behold the man. When they saw him, they cried out, crucify him, crucify him. Uh, Pilate said to them, take him yourselves and crucify him for I find no guilt in him. So he's trying to get out of it. The Jews answered, he ought to die because he has made himself the son of God. And that, that actually doesn't mean what most of you think it means. Uh, it's not talking about him being the way that we understand it. It's, it's, a, it's a political thing, what's happening. Um, this idea, the son of God, this is exactly what Caesar claimed for himself. In fact, every coin in every one of their pockets had the face of, near, or had the face of Caesar on it with the inscription, the son of God. And so, see, they, they knew how to manipulate Pilate. They knew where he was vulnerable. Essentially, they're saying this, to, to let Jesus go would be disloyal to nation. <laughs> it's pretty much, it's, it, would be, it would be unpatriotic for you to let Jesus go. So when Pilate heard these words, again, he's not a religious man. He brought Jesus out and sat him down on the judgment, or sat down on the judgment seat. He said to the Jews, behold your king. They cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, shall I crucify your king? Listen to this. The chief priests answered, we have no king but Caesar. Now, now that is an eruption of the real, right? These are, these are the priests, the ones who have been awaiting the Messiah, and they take off their masks and they say, look, we know that we're playing a game here. We know that you have no king but Caesar. And we're just wanting you to know that we have no king but Caesar either. We, we, we talk about God. We talk about the Messiah. But that's just our way of getting power. We use faith. You use conquest. But we're both playing the same game. And we also have no king but Caesar. So we're going to put our masks back on. We're going to go back to playing the priest game. But just so you know, we know what game you're playing. And we have no king but Caesar either. Okay, are we good? Are we good? Okay. Uh, and so Pilate now is stuck, right? So Pilate delivers him over to be crucified. They take Jesus away bearing his own cross to the place of the skull, this darker path into the heart of pain. Naked and bleeding, the God-man would make his way to Golgotha, for he began his letting go before the worlds were made, and Jesus marches on. Golgotha, where brutality and suffering cut through like a maddening wind, 
Bystanders and bypassers turn away and wipe his image from their memory. Nothing is alive, not even the trees, save a few left standing made crosses to torture and kill. And Jesus limps on. Golgotha, its name, its reputation, its appearance speak of ugliness and death. And Jesus trudges on. The path, sometimes a beautiful song, other times a wounded heart and a broken jaw. But still, Jesus marches on. Now is the time to loosen, cast away, the useless weight of everything but love deeper than the oceans. So carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him. And after several hours, Jesus cries out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sebektani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's, it's a prayer. There, there's a lot, of, a lot of ideas thrown out about what those words mean. Some of them good, some of them not so good. But at its core, it's, it's, it's Psalm 22. Uh, and, and he gets through about the first half. Keep in mind that Jesus, as a good Jewish boy, would know his Jewish uh, prayer book, which we call the Psalms. And so Psalm 22, he gets through the first part. Allow me to read you a little bit more. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not answer. By night as well, but I find no rest. Be not far away, O Lord, for you are my strength. Hasten to help me. Imagine Jesus on the cross. Save me from the sword, my life from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, my wretched body from the horns of wild bulls. I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. For he does not despise nor abhor the poor in their poverty. Neither does he hide his face from them. But when they cry to him, he hears them. The poor shall eat and be satisfied, and those who seek the Lord shall praise him. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nation shall bow before him. For kingship belongs to the Lord. He rules over the nations. To him alone, all who sleep in the earth bow down and worship. All who go down to the dust fall before him. My soul shall live for him. My descendants shall serve him. They shall be known as the Lord's forever. They shall come and make known to a people yet unborn the saving deeds that he has finished. Hear that last phrase. The generation to come shall make known the saving deeds that he has finished. And so after this, Jesus, knowing that it was all now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a, a sponge full of the sour wine on a branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. It is finished, right? And Jesus is dead. And after, after these things, Joseph of Arimathea came and took away his body. Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths and with spices, as is the custom for the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb where they had not yet been laid, so they laid Jesus there. And so the story shifts here where we now leave Golgotha, and along with a few women, uh, we follow Jesus and Joseph and Nicodemus as they carry Jesus' body, wrapped in cloth and spices. 
just a real short distance to a walled garden. Uh, this is Joseph's garden. Joseph is a, he's a, he's a wealthy man and he goes in his kindness he, and he unlocks the gate and they carry Jesus' body to a small and peaceful garden full of olive trees and fragrant flowers. It's a, it's a very different scene than Golgotha, right? It's, it's peaceful and it's quiet and it's beautiful. And the body of Jesus would be laid in this new tomb. This tomb was, Joseph was saving for himself, but in an act of worship for Jesus, he would, he would offer up his tomb uh, to Jesus. And we see Jesus laying in that tomb. A large stone is rolled in front of the tomb and the tomb is sealed. And for three days, there Jesus would stay. And so it's important in moments like this, in stories like these, to not just jump to the punchline of the resurrection, right? If you do, it would be like just watching the end of a movie without entering into the conflict, right? It, it doesn't mean as much if we don't enter into the waiting. And, and here's the idea, it just, just entering into this conflict and this reality that without, without God, the world would be one giant continuous nightmare, right? And so Good Friday, it's, it's, about, it's about remembering, but it's also about entering into the waiting, and, and it's not just, not just the, the idea that people were waiting for Jesus, but in so many ways, we're, we're still waiting for Jesus. Like we're, we're still waiting for God to come and make the world right, which he ultimately will. We're, many of us are still waiting for rebirth and renewal. Uh, Paul would say in Romans chapter eight that the whole earth, all of creation is groaning for redemption. Um, and so maybe for you tonight, maybe you would say that you can see yourself in that waiting. Maybe tonight you feel like you're someone who's waiting. Um, and, and, every, and every day that passes it just serves as a reminder that you're still waiting. If you would allow me to encourage you in one final thing as we wrap up tonight, um, my encouragement is this resurrection is coming. It's coming in our story tonight, but in your life as well. So take heart. Good Friday shows us and proves to us that death and pain is a reality and it's never the final word. There's always a second chapter coming. And so as, as we close tonight, we, we have just one more song that we really think encapsulates the story in a really cool way. So just relax and listen to the words um, and then you'll be dismissed. Thank you guys so much. the bread and drank the wine.
nothing but the blood of Jesus. It's nothing but the blood of church family right now we find ourselves in the waiting um, but Sunday's coming this isn't where the story ends um, so we would invite you to come back to church on Sunday morning we have services at 9 11 for Easter Sunday um, we wait now but we celebrate on Sunday and take part in that victory you are dismissed we love you God bless you have a good weekend <laughs>